this is Nathan Stuck. I'm the CEO of Whisper. And today we're going to be talking about hiring and retaining uh, employees. And, and today we're just going to get through the hiring part and then uh, for part one. And then part two will be uh, the retaining part. And uh, it's interesting with all the, uh, the coronavirus and everything that's going on there, we're having to deal with adversity. Uh, literally about a minute before we were going to go live with this, uh, we lost power at our office. And uh, I'm on uh, on a backup connection and everything, so we'll see uh, see how well uh, everything works. Uh, but hopefully everybody will get the screens, and and uh, if not, we'll re-record something for you. Uh, so employees, uh, you know, I always dreamed early on when I um, was thinking about businesses and and what what I would have is I always wanted a lot of employees and a lot of customers. And, and the reason I wanted a lot of employees is I love taking somebody that has the right attitude and the right work ethic and, and seeing them grow and, and, and influencing how they, what they can do and just, you know, kind of setting them up and empowering them and getting out of the way and watching them blossom and uh, creating that opportunity for them is, is huge for me. So I, I, I love doing that. And I, I've always dreamed of, of having a, a very large company, not because of large company, because of numbers, right? That it's not just about the numbers, but it's about the, the numbers of families and the numbers of employees we can affect. So, um, I'm going to go through today a little bit on our hiring process and what we do and try to share some of the, the things that we've come across uh, and some of the pitfalls we've learned over the years and uh, some of the ways we've dealt with those. Um, so I, I started early on um, and I have dyslexia, so I spelled a third grade level and read at a six. And um, I, I had to take summer school uh, between my fifth and sixth year. Uh, and I had my brother and two best friends working for me. Uh, they ran a lemonade stand for me. I literally paid them hourly to to be out there. And uh, it wasn't just lemonade. I actually bought candy as well and sold candy to my friends. Uh, we had an ice cream man that came around once a day, uh, and he sold candy as well. And I would spend all my money to buy all the candy I could, and then I would double the price and sell it to my friends. And you know they had no problem paying double the price because I was a convenience store, right? I was open all day, uh, whereas the ice cream and candy man was only open uh, you know, once a day when he came around and if you missed them, you missed them. So that was kind of my first, uh, foray into having employees and, and kind of dealing with, uh, not being there, um, while I was at school and how to manage all that. Um, fast forward now to, to whisper, we have over a hundred, a uh, hundred employees. Um, and we're, we're growing, we've got another 20 to 30 positions we're filling and, and we're going to be at over 200 by the end of the year. Easy. Uh, and it's it's really, really cool to be able to to move all those people around and put them in their strengths. And, and I think the other part for me is I, I come from the technical background. So I was very, very technical. Um, and, and it's one thing to be very technical. It's kind of like you're playing chess in my mind. You have all the pieces and they or you're, you're playing checkers and, and they can only go in one place here or there. Uh, whereas with employees, you're actually playing chess and you have different positions that that people flourish in different uh, for different reasons. And I, I think it's really, really cool how when you look at your employees as an asset, uh, as opposed to a liability or as opposed to just some something you have to have to get the job done. But when you really look at them as an asset, um, it allows you to do so much more. And, and now you up your game from checkers uh, to chess. Um, so I think that that's awesome. And that's something that uh, I, I look forward to doing now more, more and more. And um, We've been able to try to try to work through a process to be able to hire really, really good people, and I'm going to share that with you today. Um, as I do with all my presentations, I want you to define your success. Uh, if you're a WISP with a thousand customers and four employees, um, that's great. I, I I think very highly of you. Uh, if you have aspirations of getting into hundreds of thousands of customers like I do. Uh, then that's perfect. But if you define your success, you will always be successful. If you let other people define your success, uh, you will never be successful. There'll always be somebody that has a bigger house, more cars, more something. Uh, and I, I really hope that uh, if you take nothing else away, you take that away that you you should define your own success. Um, so, you know, this is kind of a rhetorical question, but you know, how many of you have uh, have um, are responsible for hiring? Uh, whether you're the business owner and you have to hire, whether you have to, you're responsible for hiring within your your department. Uh, usually, when I give this presentation, you know, over two thirds of the room raises their hand that they're ultimately responsible for hiring uh, of some kind. And uh, then I ask the question of how many of you have made bad hires, uh, and usually more hands go up. Right? They may not be responsible for hiring right now, but at some time during their career, they made a bad hire. 
Uh, and then I asked the question, how many of you have had to work with a bad hire? And then everybody's hands go up. Sometimes people raise both of their hands <laughs> that, you know, we've all had to work with a bad hire, uh, whether it be somebody who just doesn't fit the company, right? They don't fit the core values of the company. Um, somebody who doesn't understand what they're, what they need to be doing uh, and, and, or somebody who has a bad attitude. Maybe they're a great employee, uh, but they have a bad attitude. Um, so we've all had to deal with this, this bad hiring. And some of the statistics I was able to find, depending on who you believe, it's three to 10 times the salary of the employee. Um, we've done this a couple times with, with salespeople. Salespeople are the hardest people in my mind to, to hire because they, when are they the best? When they're selling you and you should hire them. And uh, we've hired some salespeople that it, it did, did not work out. And, and I look at it and say, okay, well, that, that didn't cost me 10 times their salary. Oh, but wait, what about all the lost business that we could have gotten during that time that they were here? And, and what is the carry on uh, for that? And what does that look like? And then it, start, it starts to get up pretty high. Um, so the traditional hiring process, I, I would say it's weak at best. Um, there's some other statistics out there that say, you know, if you were to ask any manager what they thought their success rate of getting a, a, a rock star or a very star employee in, uh, they said, well, barely 20% of the time. And, and unfortunately, what that leads to is if you have a poor performer in your ranks, uh, well, I mean, 80% of the time, I'm, I'm going to get another poor performer. So eh, I, I'm not, you know, it's not even worth me going through the hassle of training and hiring and looking for somebody. And uh, what we've tried to do at Whisper, we've tried to flip that and say, no, 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 no. It is the rare occasion that we don't bring in a star employee. Um, yes, it takes longer. Yes, we have to spend more effort on it, but it's a rare occasion. Uh, so when we have some of those underperformers, we're not held hostage. We're like, no, we will find somebody. And fortunately, in our case, we're growing so fast that usually it's just we're hiring people in, hiring people in, and we need to keep growing. And that's that's worked out very well for us to know that we have the confidence in hiring somebody who who's going to fit the role, going to fit the company. And uh, I'm going to share those with you today. Um, so it's kind of some so these are some some things that people don't think about. Um, you know, you will not always find the perfect person. Everybody says, oh, well, I, you know, the, I, I, I can't hire the perfect person. Well, hire the perfect person in your price range, right? You may not be able to find the perfect person that's willing to work for you um, at, at a lower price, at your price range, what you can afford as a business owner. But that's okay to change your expectations and say, well, I'm going to find the perfect person uh, for, for the role of the person I can afford not the person that I, that I want to. Yes, everybody wants to have, you know, CEO type, executive type people working for them, um, but maybe that's, that's out of your reach right now and you need to hire people that are perfect for your price range that you can afford. Um, so it, it needs to be, a, you need to feel okay with uh, saying that, hey, I'm, I'm not settling. I don't mean settle for a position, but I mean, look, look for people who are in the price range that you can afford and, and it's okay that they're maybe not the lofty person that you really, really wanted. Um, this is another one that I see a lot of people make the mistake of. They say, okay, well, especially me as a visionary, you know, two years out, three years out, I need this person here. Uh, so I'm willing to hire for this person. Well, wait a minute. Who did I need now? What do I need right now as opposed to who do I need down the road? Um, and one example that I have of this is we were looking for a CFO. Um, this is many years ago, probably about eight years ago. And, and really when I thought about it, I said, well, I didn't, I didn't want to see CFO. I needed a controller, a financial controller. I needed someone who could create the report, someone who was you know, close to being in the field, roll up their sleeves and get the work done. I wasn't ready for a CFO. Um, the CFO does more of the report review uh, and they, they, they do more of the strategy and what's going on there. Um, so we shifted our gears and instead of trying to look for a CFO that because of the title probably would have come with a much higher pay scale, we looked for a controller that had aspirations of becoming a CFO and said, hey, we got to get the work done now. You got to roll, roll up your sleeves and get all the work done. And I'm not saying CFOs don't roll up their sleeves and get work done, but it's a different kind of work, right? We didn't have financial reporting. We didn't have all those things we needed. And we hired the right person for who we needed. And then two years later, um, in, in our case, it was about four years later, we were able to hire that actual CFO. We had grown large enough to need, need that person. Uh, so be careful not to project what you think you need down the road, uh, and, and that makes you miss the person that you need. Um, another one you have to think about is what traits must they have? Um, a lot of times people think about 
oh, well, I, I, I want all of these traits. And it's like, okay, well, but what, what are the bare minimum that you have to have for that job to be really, really good at that job? There may be other traits that you want them to have, but what are the bare minimum that they need to have to be really good? Uh, and then you can also size it up with what skills can you teach them? Uh, some skills are more teachable than others. Um, and, and you can look at it and say, okay, well, there's a gap here. You don't have quite all the skills we need, but you fit everything else. Uh, what, what can we do uh, to, to teach those skills? And if you identify the skills that can be taught, that broadens sometimes broadens your employee uh, pool. So those are some of the things that people kind of think about. And now I want to try to step into kind of our hiring process. Uh, we have a rather lengthy hiring process. Um, and I would say lengthy as far as numbers of steps. It doesn't have to take as long, um, but I would encourage people to, to take what, what I'm sharing, mold it into their own, and then work to, to improve their, their hiring process and tweak where they need. Um, so the first one is really know when to hire, right? I mean, often small businesses, we realize too late, right? Back when I uh, ran a programming business, it was uh, either a feast or famine. I either had so much work, I, I couldn't get it all done, and I needed to hire two people, or I didn't have enough work to, to even keep myself busy. And, and it was a feast or famine. And that kind of ran into problems with me. And I didn't know when I needed to hire somebody. Uh, so we do an exercise. This is out of EOS. This is our, our accountability chart. It's kind of like an org chart, but it, but it's not. Um, and the accountability side of things is you, you close your eyes and you say, okay, where am I going to be? Where is my business going to be in, in six to 12 months? What functions do I need? Not what people, but what functions do I need to get will I need in six to 12 months? Um, and then the next phase is you go back and say, okay, now I'm going to add the people that I have. And somebody's name has to go in every box. And some people's name might go in three boxes. Um, but, but that at least lays out all the boxes for you and all the functions you need. Uh, and then we go through and we, we, we identify which ones we need to hire for. Um, we identify, you know, how many of these we need. Some of the boxes, uh, the ones, especially lower down where you have people doing the same task, but maybe in a different geographic area, that's okay having multiple people's name in one box. Uh, but generally, as you go up, you would only have one person in, in the box name. They're ultimately responsible for it. But this lays out what functions and what people you need. And if you're a small business of five people, you might have 10 boxes and everybody might have two, two, um, uh, two uh, boxes they're responsible for. But that's okay because in a small business, that's what you have to do. And then as you grow, it's very clear what people you need to add and what boxes. So I would really encourage you before you say, hey, I'm just going to go start hiring people because I need them or whatever, really, really evaluate the who do you actually need? What functions are you actually doing? And, and given a perfect world and a dream situation, what functions do you need? And then you can go back in and add, um, add either a, hey, I need to hire somebody new for this role or add somebody from your company into that role. And it really helps you formulate a plan uh, over the next six months to a, to a year. If you're growing super, super fast, maybe you do it every six months. If you're not growing that fast, maybe it's an every two year process. But I think the accountability chart is something that's really, really important to, to have to start laying out that plan. Uh, the next one is your job posting. Um, I, I love this one. You know, we're looking for someone that has is detail oriented, creative, task oriented, gets along with others, ambitious and innovative, and a rule follower. Um, and and I'm pretty sure that's what's called a unicorn, uh, right? You're not going to find somebody that has all of those traits. And it's easy when you write a job description to say these are what these are the traits we want. Well, of course, everybody would want to find somebody that's perfect like that. Um, but you want to be very careful that you're not looking for you know somebody who's all things to all people. And then when you hire them, you have this expectation that they fit this mold that you have. And then three months in, six months in, you're very disappointed because they don't fit that mold because they they were trying to be all things to all people and you had projected that on them. So the example that I like to give in this case is um, I really don't want creative people in my finance department, right? I, I want creative people in my marketing department, <laughs> and I want rule followers in my finance department. I want people in my finance department that, that are very task-oriented, that, that understand what needs to get done. They're very detail-oriented. But in my marketing department or in my sales department, I want people who are more outgoing, who who, who get along with others and and are just, hey, you know, the I, they connect with everybody. So when you're really, really thinking about the type of people you need, 
think about the tasks and think about back to that the the accountability chart right within the accountability chart you list the different major tasks that they do we'll compare that to the skill set that you're looking for uh and when you describe uh the position um and, and that's where it comes down to what are those key tasks that are required um, what do you need like one of our accounting positions we have is it's, it's, a, it's accounting clerk and they're they need to be very detail oriented and it's very very task oriented just pound through the task of, of getting this stuff in and one thing we always ask in our interviews for accounting is do you love numbers and do you love excel right <laughs> because that's what they're dealing with mostly and and we want to find out if you know if that's something that they can do day in day out because they love doing it then that's probably a a good fit for them as opposed to being somebody who's no 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 I like to be creative and I like to do things in you know new ways in my way that may not fit so well uh, into a, into your finance department. Um, so this one, just again, be careful that you're not trying to find somebody that's all all people to all th all things to all people. Uh, the next one is we collect the r uh, resumes. Um, we typically list on Indeed. Um, we've done it on several job postings in our our area where we have Chamber of Commerce boards. Uh, we post resumes. We 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 collect the resumes. Um, we don't put a huge value in, in, in resumes, and I, and I say this with a caveat, right? I mean, when we get two to 300 applicants for one role, yes, you have to start somewhere with the resume. Uh, the first thing we look for is, is your resume anything to do with what we're asking for, right? I, I, when you get the cover letter that says, I would love to use my executive chef um, skills to further my career working, you know, it doesn't even say working for Whisper in this job. It's like, what? And then you look at their resume and all it is is chef positions. It's like, okay, clearly they're just sending out the resume to anybody, toss that one in the trash. Um, and then when we're, we look at the resume, we're looking for general, um, general experiences. So if we're looking for a networking person, we want you to have networking experience. We want you to have worked for different companies that do networking as opposed to being a financial banker that's saying, yes, I can come in and, and do this. You may have a great resume for a financial banker, but you don't have one for hours uh, for what we're looking for in our networking. Um, and we, we don't look at all the, the nitty gritty specifics. We look at some of those general things and then uh, we take it to our next step, which is the the, the phone interview. Um, but but a couple of the other things we're looking for is job hopping. Um, so, you know, every six to 12 months, you're at a new job. Um, that could be a problem, maybe not, maybe it is. I, I'm not saying that's something, a reason to, to disqualify somebody, but that's what we're looking for. Uh, we also look for gaps, uh, gaps in employment uh, to see you know, why is there a gap? Uh, we had one gentleman who we, we ultimately ended up not hiring anybody for, for the position. We actually closed the position without hiring anybody, but every 18 months to two years, he had a new job in a new town. And we, we talked to him in the interview and we're like, hey, you know, just out of curiosity, we're kind of concerned about this. Why is that? He goes, oh, no, 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 no. My wife is a meteorologist. And I every time there was a position that opened, I had to move because in the meteorology world, typically somebody stays there for 20 years. So you had to kind of, as somebody retired, you had to move. And, and it was like, oh, wow. Well, every 18 to 20 months, you have a new job. There's no gap of employment. You're always able to find another job. That's very, very impressive, actually. And you're moving for a reason that, that's out of your control. Uh, so that that works very well. Uh, another gentleman we had done an interview with, uh, we asked him about a gap in his employment, and he had to um, he he took off some time from work to stay home and take care of his his mother that was sick. Uh, and it's like, okay, well that makes total sense. You took off some time, and then you got back into the workforce. Um, we've had some other ones that took off uh, what we call a a a mandatory extended vacation. <laughs> you know, they had some jail time in there and different things, and uh, you know, so those are things that you can kind of get out when you when you talk to them. Um, about some of their gaps, but gaps aren't always a bad thing and job hopping isn't always a bad thing, but it does throw kind of a little bit of a red flag for us um, that if we were teeter-tottering on the side of, well, this person doesn't have a lot of experience that we need. Oh, and they have a lot of job hopping. Uh, maybe we'll pass on them, especially when we get so many resumes in. Uh, the next one we do is a, a schedule a phone interview. Um, this one is is actually super important and it, it's an interesting small little, little um, thing that we do. So Sometimes based on the resume, it's really hard to narrow down good people. And you're like, okay, do I err on the side of getting rid of people or do I err on the side of, of having people interview? But I can't afford to spend a two, or two hour or one hour interview with everybody. Uh, so we do a very quick uh, um, phone interview. Uh, this is where it's about 10 to 15 minutes. 
Um, we have them call us because we're wanting to see, can you call us proactively on time? Um, can we hear you on the phone? Is, is it, is it uh, you know, can you um, articulate your words on, on the phone with us? Can you speak clearly on the phone? A lot of our positions are over the phone anyway, so this helps us. But even for our positions that aren't, we still do a phone interview. Um, if you no show, no call for a phone interview, the person who was doing the phone interview still sits there and they get their work done just like it was never, never happened. And then we, 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 we take them out of the candidate pool uh, unless they have a very good excuse. Uh, we have every once in a while somebody had a, a medical emergency or physically couldn't call us for some reason. Uh, we, we might give them the benefit of the doubt. But typically, if you miss our phone interview, you're, you're done. Uh, we talk a little bit about cultural um, fit with the phone interview. We talk a little bit about, we ask some general questions. Sometimes we have um, some more specific questions that we've picked up by reviewing their, their resume. You know, what do you mean by this or what is this part? But generally, um, they're, they're, they're simpler questions and it's more just to see, can you show up on time? Are you articulate over the phone? Uh, and, and, and that's kind of our, our next step. Um, we also talked to them about the top grading form. And, and this is a top grading, this is our next step that we have. Is a, it's a form that you fill out. Um, but top top grading is is a book that that I've, I've read that's great. It's on our book list at the end of this presentation. That you know, it's a form that you fill out, and it, think of it basically as your work history from from high school all the way to your current job. It asks you the exact same questions about every job. What um, what would your manager say were your weaknesses and and your strengths? What would you say your manager uh, weaknesses were? Uh, and it's a really, really good form because what you're looking for is patterns. Um, so the first thing is we tell them about it. We send it out to them and they have to complete it before we move on to the next step. And you might say, well, wait a minute. That means a lot of people aren't going to fill it out. Well, yeah, probably aren't. A players enjoy filling it out because it's kind of like a walk through memory lane, down memory lane, right? Oh, well, I remember working for Bill. He was a great manager. And this is what I loved about this job. And this is why I left the company. Or, oh, you know, oh, Susie, she was amazing. You know, I learned a lot from her and everything. They enjoy filling it out and they're willing to take the hour, 30 minutes, whatever it takes them to fill out um, to, to come work for your company. Uh, B and C players, um, we've had one person say, well, this is ridiculous. Why in the world would I fill out this form and I don't even have a job with you? And it's like, yes, you are correct. And you will not get a job for us, <laughs> right? Because it, if they're not willing to take that little bit of time to tell us about them and fill out that form, um, it, it's not, it's not worth having them be part of our, uh, part of our team and taking them on to the next step. So they self-select out. Um, a couple of the things we, we do this a little differently though, with top grading is some of our positions are very, uh, construction oriented, very much field outside, uh, not sitting behind a computer. Um, a lot of those, we don't necessarily require the top grading form. Um, what I was seeing is we were disqualifying a lot of very, very good candidates. Uh, that just were not very good at filling out forms and, and reading. Myself having dyslexia, um, I hate filling out forms. I hate going through those. And, and I didn't want to disqualify a really, really good worker that had the right work ethic and the right attitude um, just because he couldn't fill out a form or she couldn't fill out a form that honestly wasn't needed for their job role. So we, we have been able to modify that a little bit. Um, but on this form, it, it really, really helps us understand uh, who who the person is and and what their job their job history is. Uh, so then after that, you send that back to us. Um, then we schedule our first interview. Uh, this interview is more of a technical interview. Um, right now we do it with people that they'll be working with. The manager that they'll be working with uh, does the interview process. Uh, we ask cultural fit questions. Uh, and then after that, we kind of share Whisper's core value and, and vision. And, and we're playing with a couple things. We're getting ready to hire hundreds of people. Uh, just with where we are with the growth of Whisper. So we're kind of toying with maybe hiring somebody who's really, really good at interviewing and 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 letting them do the interview process for some of our managers. Um, but we really like the managers to be part of it. But not everybody's very good at reading some of the nuances into interviews and and everything. So just to be be honest, that's kind of some some of the things where we're we're kind of looking at changing some of the things we're doing. But for many, many years we did this where we want the manager to be involved. They should be involved. At some point, uh, maybe they don't do the interview, but maybe they re review the resumes, and then ultimately they have a final interview with the the candidate before they come on board. Uh, but this this first interview is just to see, you know, do they have the skills and what's the what's the cultural fit that they have. Um, and then we do a second interview, 
Um, and that, that first interview, let me step back one, one, you know, so our funnel, right? So every step you should be getting less and less, um, less and less uh, candidates. Our first interview, we may have about eight-ish people. We may have 15 to 20 on the phone interview, eight-ish people. And then the second interview, we try to really get that down anywhere from two to four people uh, that we would bring in for that. Um, and, and this, the second interview is the top grading form. This is where we go over the top grading form, where we step through um, basically your, your job history. And what we're looking for is patterns again. So like one of the gentlemen we were looking at hiring for an installer position, um, we had asked, he had been an installer for multiple companies and we had asked them all along, you know, what are the weaknesses? And he said, well, I have a messy vehicle. I have a messy vehicle. I'm not very organized. I have a messy vehicle. And then when we got to the final question is, what do you think your three strengths are and what do you think your three weaknesses are? He said one of his strengths was that he's very detail oriented. He's very organized, organized because he's learned his lesson. And it's like, okay, what I'm looking for is that you learned your lesson seven years ago and it no longer became a weakness. You haven't learned your lesson in the last two, in the last two months since uh, you, you were at your last job. And now all of a sudden you're going to become a more, um, you, you know, a more organized person. Uh, so we're looking for those. Uh, the other thing we're looking for is we ask what their what type of manager they had and was the manager a good manager or a bad manager. We had one employee who five out of the last six positions he had, he worked for bad managers. The manager was the problem. The owners were too hard to work with or whatever. And it was like, whoa, whoa wait a minute. There's a common denominator here and you're it, right? There's there's six six people you've worked for and five of them are bad managers. I didn't want to be the the sixth bad manager, right? Um, but what happened was when we did our reference calls, um, which we do, a lot of people don't do that, but we do do the reference calls. But the difference with our reference calls is it's it's not who you, um, you don't list the reference calls. We ask you, can we call this person? Can we call that person? And when I called their references, some of the people still worked at the businesses they were at and they said of their own, well, the owners were very hard to work for, or this didn't, this didn't work right. They didn't give them the tools that needed. Um, so that, that worked out really, really well uh, for us to be able to validate that, okay, maybe this gentleman um, isn't the common denominator, the problem, problem. And we would not have known that had we not done the, the, the top grading um, form that we have. Uh, and the other interesting thing by doing two interviews is that you can pick up inconsistencies. We always have at least one person in both interview. So it's the same person in, in both interviews. We might rotate out different people in the other ones, but it's, it's always at least one person is common. Uh, and I remember we were we were interviewing for my executive assistant uh, many, many years ago, and we asked the one lady if she had any um, HR experience. And she said, no, no, no real HR experience. And then a week later, we asked the same question again, a different employee, just there was a list of questions. I asked her if she had any HR experience, and she said, yes, extensive. So I was like, what? Oh, that's kind of weird. And then we went back and compared in our notes, and and no, we had written it down correctly. And so it's like, okay, wait a minute, either you lied to us the first time and you, you did have it, you just said no, or you lied to us the second time, or you became an expert and have extensive knowledge in it in a matter of a week. That's pretty, pretty impressive. So, and, and some of her other question or answers to questions didn't line up either as we were talking to her. So it was, it was a very easy way for us to disqualify her that we knew we had, hey, no, this isn't just our gut feeling. This is, we have some discrepancies here. Um, some of the things with this is that we can combine these into the, the same uh, position or same, same, same day. Um, and then we can also combine some of these. Sometimes we put it, our first and second interview is the same one, uh, and we're able to, to do that. But if you want to speed up your, um, your actual uh, interviewing, you can do them all on the same day. Um, so here's some of my favorite questions uh, when we're doing some of our interview. Um, I love asking the question is, how do you make a hot dog? Um, this one people think, and they're, it's so interesting, right? If you, if I asked you if you're detail oriented and you thought I was looking for a detail oriented answer, you would say, oh, well, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm very detail oriented, even if you aren't. Um, if I ask you how to make a hot dog and you say, oh, well, um, I don't know. I mean, you take it out, you put it in the microwave and you eat it. You are not a very detailed person. But if, if I ask you how to make a hot dog and you're like, oh, well, 
well, what kind of hot dog are you making? Are you making a brat or are you making a normal hot dog? And, and my response is, how do you make a hot dog? I just, I just repeat the question. And they're like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to assume you're making a hot dog because, you know, it's kind of cold outside and we're not going to do brats. Um, so then I, I get to get out and then I got to make sure I have a bun first. And then I always like mine with cheese. So I got to have it with cheese and, and mayonnaise. And then, you know, I, I, I cook it on the, on the stove. I prefer to do them in water. Or sometimes the person says, I'll just do them in the microwave, heat them up just right. And then I make my sandwich, you know, make my, my hot dog bun out of it. And then I eat it. That's a very detailed person's response. But if I had asked you, if you're just a detailed person, then you know exactly what I'm looking for. But when I ask you, how do you make a hot dog? That that's what I'm looking for. Another one I like to ask is if you could live anywhere in the world, uh, where would it, where would you live? And, and one of our, our controllers we were hiring for, uh, the person answered it very, very well. I thought for control, right? I want somebody who's analytical. I want somebody who looks at all the facts and then makes a decision. And the person responded, they're like, well, I haven't been everywhere in the world yet. So I'm not sure I could answer the question of where in the world I would want to live. But of the places I've lived, you know, and then they went into where they thought the, the favorite place they would ever live or, or where they traveled. So it's a roundabout way to understand what makes up the people and what their what their um what what kind of some of their just they can make up answers uh, to some of the questions when you know when you ask a direct question but when you ask an indirect question it's a little harder to do that um so those are a couple i won't read all of them but those are a couple of ones that we like to use um then moving on to our disk assessment so we do a disk assessment you can do this is a personality test if you will um, we don't ever really disqualify anybody for these and we don't we all of these steps we do it's a it's a whole conglomeration of things um, but what this personality test is it it kind of verifies or, or helps us with contradictory we had one one lady every answer she had was well, as long as i'm helping people as long as i'm helping people as long as i'm helping people and we said okay that's great and then when she took the personality test you would have thought her social which is very very high love to help people would have been very high it was extremely low and then we kind of put two and two together on a couple other questions that she had answered. It just seemed like she was telling us what she wanted to hear, what we wanted to hear, not what was really true about her. So again, this don't they don't qualify or disqualify people. Uh, what we use these for a lot is for um, the gap analysis afterwards. So we've hired you, and now here's a couple areas where we want you to work on or what we need to do. Um, the, the next one we do is dinner with the CEO. Uh, so this one, uh, it, it, we, or we do the manager. Uh, I took this one from Dave Ramsey. He he does it, uh, and and it's it's a great thing. My wife, one, she was complaining about that she never gets to go out to dinner with me. Uh, so we started doing this, and we hired so many people. She's like, well, I don't want to go out anymore. Um, but what we're looking for here is we call them, we tell them it's you and your significant other, uh, and and we go out to dinner. Um, I do you show up on time? Are you kind to the waiters? I heard in, in one of the books I read, one of the guys he. Uh, he on purpose, he works with the wait staff and on purpose, they, they mess up the order uh, because you might be to their face to the waiter. Oh, it's okay. It's no problem. And then as soon as the waiter walks away, well, that girl's so stupid. She didn't pick up this. She didn't understand this. And it's like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. You know, that's how you really are. Uh, so we're looking for all those things. And plus, when you go out to dinner with somebody, um, there's a lot of things you're not allowed to ask in an interview, which is totally fine. But when you're actually having a, a conversation and they bring up something, uh, then you're allowed to talk about it because they're the ones bringing it up and, and everything. Uh, so the, the next one we do is our, our call references. Uh, a lot of people um, don't do this because, oh, it doesn't do any good when we call our references. They don't, you know, they, they just tell us anything just to get the person hired. Um, but really, we, we call the references uh, and we, um, we, we call them uh, because we, we want to call the ones that we want to call, though. Uh, and we're able to, to ask them questions and, and understand how that person is. Uh, and then the last step is uh, we make an offer and, and negotiate uh, if needed. Uh, sometimes that negotiation works well. Sometimes it, it doesn't. But I don't want anybody to feel like you you have to, you know, we are completely fine to come down to the end of a, of a long process of hiring and going through so many candidates and not hire anyone. Uh, because we don't think that they're necessarily the right fit for Whisper or we didn't find anybody. It's way better to start over the process than it is to actually just hire somebody you know that isn't going to be a fit. And that kind of comes back to that. I can make, you know, I, I have a better chance than 20% of getting a success. We want to have an 80 to 90% chance of getting success. 
Uh, and that's what we're, we're able to do, being willing to, to kind of walk away. Um, so here are a couple of great books um, that, uh, that I'll, I'll wrap up with today. Uh, we'll put these on the list of, uh, at the end of the, the comment section there. Uh, but Top Grading, I think that's a great book. Uh, Simon Sinek's got several really good books. Um, but th these are all good books to help you understand and, and your frame of reference for, uh, for hiring uh, people. Uh, it's so vitally important. You know, we've talked about how expensive uh, a bad hire is, and I think it's super, super important that you spend time. You know, we used to hire four people, knowing that only two of them were going to work out, or you you hire the first person that doesn't smell, <laughs> and, and you know, and you bring them in, and then you wonder why three months later they're not working out. If you can spend some really quality time on hiring, um, then it, it makes a lot of things a lot easier because now you have the right people. The, the, the right uh, people working for you for your core values, the right people working for you for the role they're filling. And, and now you, you're all going in the same direction because you've been able to spend that time. Um, so with that, I'm gonna see if we have any questions. Next week, we're gonna talk about uh, how to keep your keep your customers, right? How do, or I mean, your employees. How do you keep your employees? How do you do retention? And there's, there's several things that you can do, starting with what happens day one uh, when they come work for you. Uh, so let's see, because the power went out, I don't have um, a Skype all set up the way. And let's see if we have any other questions here. Um, okay, looks like um, we, we do have one here. And, and one question is, well, when you call their references, you know, aren't they not allowed to talk to you? Um, you know, and they can just say, yes, this person worked here from here to here. And that does happen sometimes. Um, in top grading, um, uh, Bradford talks about how he's never, ever had a problem with references before. Um, people who, A players, people want to tell you all about them. They're, they're excited. It's like talking about a good friend. Uh, they're usually not doing it in, in reference to work. They're doing it in reference to a, a personal uh, referral. Um, so I, I wouldn't discourage anybody from even though, you know, the, the corporate stance is I can only say when they've worked there, when they stopped. Um, he, he clearly states that they've had no problems with references and, and we've, uh, we've seen that as well. Uh, no problems with that. So um, uh, another question I get a ton is just, it seems like so much work. Yes, it is so much work, uh, but go back and think about all of the time you spend dealing with bad employees or dealing with employees that don't quite fit and, and how painful that is and how much time you could have spent doing other things, growing your business. And a little bit of upfront uh, work goes a long way in moving your company uh, into the, the next level that you need to be at. So I'd highly recommend you, you spend some more time and chime in to our, our, our next, uh, next um, week's call where we talk about retaining um, your employees. All right, let's see. So we do have some more questions here. Um, not much. So uh, what is the gain, let's see, this question is, what is the gain uh, that is achieved in hiring hundreds of people and growing that much versus having a solid company with solid income and growth? Oh, so, so yeah, so that's a, that's a really, really good question. And, and I don't want anybody to ever think that we grow just for the sake of growing, right? When you look at these large companies that grow and then declare bankruptcy and then lay a whole bunch of people off and then grow again, and it's all about being big. Um, we're, we're growing, one, because there's a massive demand out there for bandwidth and broadband, and we love providing service to people. That is, that is what we love to do. We provide them internet. Uh, we love being the ones that come into a town where no one else will. Um, but we, we want a Connect America fund. So it's, it's um, a government, uh, basically, subsidy to build out to 80,000 locations across uh, six states. So um, we're getting government funding from that, and we're growing. So our growth, yes, I would say maybe not slow and steady, but steady and, and smart and don't overgrow because we've been there too as a company where we've grown too fast and then your customer service fails and, and then you have to retool and what do you do? Um, but right now we're growing very, very quickly because of this, uh, we have to build out to those 80,000 locations and we have aspirations of growing out to, to even more. So that's, that's why we're doing it. Um, let's see, next one. Okay, so they ask, uh, what about the type that is organized with data and technical things, but not an organized truck? Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely something, you know, you have to weigh up um, 
And it kind of comes back to the comment of what, um, what tasks do you really, really need? Uh, to provide really, really good service to my customers, I don't need you to have an organized truck, right? You don't have to have that. Um, however, if I'm hiring you for a position that requires you to be organized, my inventory manager or my inventory technician, um, I, I, that's very, very important to me. And, and seeing a vehicle uh, not being organized tells me that, you know, that you're not OCD about being organized. Therefore, it's going to be a struggle for you to be organized uh, here uh, as opposed to uh, naturally just being an organized person. Um, so then the, the, another question we have, is this a hiring process for every employee or mid or high level um, examples, pay levels? So that's a that's a good question. We 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 tailor it a little bit. We 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 can definitely hire quicker for the the lower paid positions, and we take a lot longer for the high paid. But I, I would want you to think that this hiring process, think of this as the middle bar. So that's that's where we are. Uh, we've just hired several people onto our leadership team. Multiple more e interviews with them. Our entire leadership team interviewed them one on one. Uh, we've done secondary group interviews. We we've done all those things. Um, that that it's super important that we get a leadership person exactly right because that then affects their entire department. Um, some of the other ones we've, we we have cut it down a little bit to where it's not nearly as rigorous. Um, what we normally are able to do is just condense the timeline. Uh, we still try to go through all the steps. Another place where we kind of deviate some is if it's a, a referral, somebody I've worked with for a long time that I'm like, yeah, I would love to hire that person. Or one of our leadership team people says, hey, I've got a great candidate. We still bring in other people to to um, uh, to reference them against to say yes, this is a good person based on all the other people we hired, uh, but we do give them more of a benefit of the doubt, and we're able to to come in and and handle those a little bit differently. Uh, and then let's see, the the last one I think we have is is the fire truck still working uh, and still using it? So I love that question. That's awesome. Uh, the fire truck is still here. You can still turn it on. Um, the hydraulics are still shot and they've been shot for a couple years and uh, I'm dying to get those things fixed so we can take it out. I've, I've got a friend that's running for a political office and he wants to use it in parades again. And it's like, oh, we're going to have to spruce up the fire truck. And, you know, I've ruined my kids. They won't go to a parade unless they're in it now. Uh, we were at when the Cardinals won the World Series, we went down to the parade down there and they were so upset that we weren't. Well, Daddy, how come we're not in this parade? It's like, it's not for us. They're like, no, 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 it, it, we have to, I mean, why can't we? It's like, it's not for us. Well, can't you just like tell them that you want to be in it? It's like, no, this is for the Cardinals, not for Whisper and their fire truck. Uh, so yes, it, we, we have some other temporary towers we use uh, now, but I, I want to get the fire truck back up 100% operational and, and have some fun with that. So um, thanks for that, uh, that great question there. So let me see. So I, I think that's uh, about all we have time for here. Thanks for uh, sending in some good questions. I love. I wish we could do these more interactive, but uh, I think these are these are working out well, and I appreciate you taking the time. And next week we're going to be talking about the um, retaining, and, and there's some very specific steps to get put your best foot forward as the employer that I think a lot of a lot of employee employers miss, and, and it's just, just we have to set the right tone for when the employee comes in and how we can do those. We're going to talk about some practical ways to do that. So, thank you very much. Have a great rest of your week.